Hello everyone and welcome. In this video we are talking about one of the most efficient cars ever created. This is the Mercedes EQXX and it is the most efficient car Mercedes has ever created. Now what's really cool about this vehicle is it gives us a starting point to basically determine what is the theoretical limit on efficiency and energy consumption for cars. Now let's say you want to create a vehicle that can travel a thousand kilometers or about 600 miles. Well, it's very easy to do. If it's a gasoline car, you simply give it a large fuel tank. If it's an electric car, you simply give it a giant battery. Technically, it is very possible. But what if you want to do that as efficiently as possible? So if you look at today's cars, a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack is good for about 300 miles or about 500 kilometers. So Mercedes set out to double this. In other words, take that same 100 kilowatt hour battery pack, but instead of traveling 500 kilometers, travel 1,000 kilometers. Okay, so if we're to translate Mercedes' goal into an energy consumption number, what they are targeting is 10 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers driven. And so if you're from the US and you're like, what the heck does that mean? Basically what they're talking about is about 209 miles per gallon equivalent. Miles per gallon is a terrible unit, so we're going to try to avoid using it in this video, but we're gonna be looking at five different aspects of the car that help create this consumption number and what those specific numbers are for Mercedes in each of these five categories. All right, so to set the mood, we're gonna start off with this beautiful plot right here. And what we're focusing on is this purple line. So what does this purple line show us? Well, it shows us at any given constant vehicle speed while traveling on flat ground, what is our Mercedes EQXX energy consumption in kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers? For example, if we are traveling 10 kilometers per hour, we can see that our energy consumption is about five kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. So you might wonder, okay, well, why does this have the shape that it has? So if you think about, if you're sitting at a stoplight, you've got your screen on, maybe you've got a fan on, you've got music on, you're consuming energy, but you're not moving. So your relative energy consumption is very high. Uh, it's basically infinite if you're not moving. And then that as you start to move, the importance of that screen being on is very little if you're traveling at a high speed. But as you get to higher speeds, then you start to run into aerodynamic drag as a problem. So it gives you this shape here where your floor is made up of rolling resistance. It's not a perfect line, but for the purposes of this video, that's fine. So for this Mercedes EQXX, what they're doing is trying to optimize a car for efficiency within this range right here at higher speeds. They want a high speed efficient vehicle. In other words, they want it to be efficient on the highway. Now, that doesn't mean that if it were to drive slower, it wouldn't get better efficiency. It would. It would get better fuel economy, better energy consumption, if they were to drive slower, but they're optimizing it for driving on the highway. So we'll talk about what that means a bit later, but know that this is what it's optimized for. If you were to design a vehicle that was always going to be driving at a lower speed, you would do things differently. But we live in the real world. We wanna drive in the real world at real world speeds. So that's what they're designing it for. So for the speeds that Mercedes is targeting, aerodynamics makes up 62% of the overall energy consumed. So if you look at the equation for aerodynamic drag, well, you can look at what are the variables that I can mess around with in order to improve aerodynamics. And there's only two that you really can control from a design standpoint, your drag coefficient and the frontal area. So as far as the drag coefficient, basically what you're doing is, you know a human has to sit in that car, right? So you take a five to 95% human, you put them within a space, and then you try and design a car around that space uh, so that the human can fit and you have a really aerodynamic shape around them that also looks like a car. Part of the requirement is it needs to look like a car. So if you look at cars like the Mercedes EQS, which is a production car, and when it came out, it was the most aerodynamic vehicle from a drag coefficient standpoint, lowest drag coefficient of just 0.20. 
That's exceptionally good. I mean, we're getting towards the bottom of what is possible with production cars. A penguin uh, has a drag coefficient of just 0.05. You know, so we could be driving penguins. Maybe we should be driving penguins, but we're not. Uh, we're driving cars. And so this number, this drag coefficient for the EQXX is 0.17, which is better than the best production car. Um, there's, some, there's some disclaimers that go along with this. First of all, there's a diffuser that retracts out from the back of the vehicle. That gives you a point, so that takes you down from 0.18 down to 0.17. Also, this 0.17 is with the cooling shutters closed. So there's some outlets, some exhaust vents on the hood of the car. Uh, if this is actually opened and you're allowing airflow through the front of the car with the shutters, then that's giving you an additional 0.007 to your drag coefficient. So with both of those, that's putting you closer to 0.19. Mercedes says that if you get to a drag coefficient of around 0.16, well, then it stops looking like a car. One example uh, is, you know, Mercedes said they could have gotten down to 0.16, but they would have had to cover the rear wheels. And they didn't want to cover the rear wheels because it's ugly. I mean, a lot of us agree. So it is possible that you can get below a number like 0.2, uh, but it starts to look less and less like a car. And honestly, if you look at the EQS, you know, at 0.2, it's like, does that thing look like a car? I guess kind of. Uh, but the point is, you get towards a limit, right? And Mercedes says that limit's 0.16 unless you start covering the wheels. And realistically, you know, that's with some things happening there uh, that are kind of hard to achieve with a production car. So we're towards the limit when it comes to drag coefficient. Okay, so the next aerodynamic variable we can play with is the frontal area. And what I like about this is that they kept it realistic. So the EQXX has a frontal area of 2.12 meters squared. Uh, you can compare that to vehicles like the Prius or Tesla Model 3, which have frontal areas of about 2.2 meters squared. So while this is on the low end of like a mid-size sedan, uh, it's basically the smallest practical size. There are vehicles out there with smaller uh, frontal areas, for example, the old Honda Insight or a smart car, uh, but there's a reason why all of us aren't driving smart cars, right? There's a practical element to having a larger sedan, uh, so they're trying to keep it within the realm of practicality, and we have this frontal area of 2.12 meters squared. All right, so if we move on to weight, Mercedes says this makes up about 20% of the overall energy consumption. And so once again, if we go to our equation for, you know, how much energy is being lost from weight and what variables can we control? Well, we can control the mass of the vehicle and the tires we select. So the mass of this vehicle uh, is 1,755 kilograms which isn't all that light of a vehicle, but compared to Mercedes electric car, the EQS, uh, that's coming in at about 2,500 kilograms. So it is significantly lighter. Now, as you know, the battery makes up a significant percentage of the overall weight of an electric car. So it is very interesting to analyze the battery in this vehicle. So here I've got an example of a production Mercedes, the EQS. Here we have an example of a competitor, a, you know, a Tesla Model S with a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack, and then we have our prototype EQXX. So here we have the battery size in kilowatt hours, here we have the battery weight in kilogram, here we have the battery volume in liters, and then we can look at, so we can compare them directly, the energy densities by mass and by volume. So the EQS has an energy density of 150 watt hours per kilogram versus the Tesla Model S production car, which is at 186 watt hours per kilogram. The EQS production Mercedes at 215 watt hours per liter with the Model S at 250 watt hours per liter. Now the EQXX with its prototype battery achieving an even better 202, so still fairly close, but better than the Model S watt hours per kilogram but a very impressive volumetric uh, energy density of 400 watt hours per liter. All right, so how do you achieve such an impressive volumetric energy density? Well, one of the major factors is that this battery has passive cooling. So it doesn't have cooling channels, liquid cooling channels, passing through the battery. Now that immediately raises some concerns, right? This is just a big box of cells. Uh, so you can get a lot of you know, energy density into a relatively small space. 
However, we need to think about heat. Heat is the enemy of batteries. Also cold temperatures, right? If this thing were to be starting in super cold temperatures, you'd probably want like some sort of resistive heater within the battery in order to heat up those cells before you get going. But heat is what we're really talking about here. So if you have a lot of heat being generated within this battery pack, well, you need to be able to get rid of that heat. The thing is, we're talking about a super efficient powertrain. So we're not generating that much heat. So we really don't have to think about it as much from an active cooling standpoint. However, you still have to charge the battery pack, right? And charging is gonna put a lot of heat into that battery pretty much no matter what. So you can limit the charge rate in order to reduce how much heat you get building up in that pack. Well, it's still at a charge rate limit of 120 kilowatts, which is actually pretty good. Now you might say, you know, that's kind of trash compared to the Hummer EV which can be charged at 350 kilowatts. Well, yes, this is about three times the number, right? But actually, because this vehicle is so inefficient, if you're to look at, if you charge for just 10 minutes, how far can you travel with either charge rate? For the Hummer, that turns out to be about 130 kilometers. For the Mercedes, that's 200 kilometers. So even though the charge rate is a third, because it's so much more efficient, you can actually go further with however much amount of time you spend at a charger. Now, I don't know how feasible passive cooling in a production car actually is, because we have some examples of electric cars with passive cooling and the batteries tend to have pretty poor longevity. They don't last that long. And so one of the things that is acting in Mercedes advantage here is that while they may not have active cooling for their system and heat does kill batteries, uh, they are operating under fewer charge cycles because of their efficiency. So if you think about a car that travels 300 miles and that takes a full battery charge to do it because it has a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack, well, that's only half the battery in this Mercedes. So to travel the same distance, let's say 200,000 miles, it's gonna take half the amount of total charges in order to travel that distance. So while it is at a disadvantage from a cooling standpoint, it doesn't have active cooling, it's probably going to operate under far fewer charge cycles over its lifetime than a different product. And so because of that, perhaps the longevity issue is not as big of a concern. All right, so getting back to rolling resistance, we have our vehicle's weight, and then we have the coefficient of rolling resistance of the tires. So our tire selection is critically important. These are specially designed tires for this vehicle, and they have a coefficient of rolling resistance. Mercedes was only willing to tell me that it was less than 0.005. I don't know what the actual number is, but I know that it's less than that number. Uh, they have a max load rating of 50 PSI for the inflation pressure. And so they told me that they were getting close to this number for inflation. So again, we're getting close to theoretical limit of like coefficient of rolling resistance, how much rolling resistance we're gonna have because it's unrealistic for a vehicle at this weight to get into pressures that are much higher than that uh, and numbers that are much lower than this. So, you know, it could be a 0.004, but point is these are extremely efficient tires. So they've done their homework as far as getting a very efficient tire on this vehicle. All right, so our final category, Mercedes says everything else makes up for 18% of the energy consumption. So this is including things like our powertrain efficiency, our electric systems, HVAC. Uh, I believe it includes acceleration, deceleration, because 18% is still a pretty significant amount. Uh, interesting thing about this vehicle, it is rear wheel drive. And you might think, okay, if I'm designing an electric car for maximum efficiency, I might wanna choose front wheel drive because as I'm decelerating and you have that weight shift forward, the maximum rate the amount of energy that you can pull from that front axle will be greater than the rear axle. So long as you're reaching really high deceleration rates, right? As long as you keep it within normal rates, you know, 0.2 G of decelerating, well, you can do that with the rear axle. You don't have so much load transfer going to the front uh, that that's an impossible number to reach. So that's kind of one of those design choices here. Another one of those design choices, they actually took a two-speed transmission from a future electric Mercedes and they removed the first gear. So the first gear mostly used for accelerating, they basically just kept the highway gear and optimized that single gear for that driving speed that they believe it's gonna spend most of its time at. So choosing the gearing and just that one gear rather than having more moving parts, more weight, uh, because they have the luxury of designing something 
just for efficiency for one specific scenario. Now, a super impressive number relating to this EQXX is the powertrain efficiency of 95%. And this is not a peak. This is not this single point where, okay, let's pick the absolute best scenario, best point, and we can achieve 95%. This is over their internal long distance driving cycle, uh, basically like a highway driving cycle. They can achieve 95% powertrain efficiency. And so to kind of illustrate how crazy this is, and there are other cars out there that can do this. Uh, this has been achieved in Formula E, for example, but those are race cars. This is trying to be a road car. Uh, but if you look at, for example, a battery that can discharge with an efficiency of 99.5, an inverter, you know, that energy goes from the battery to the inverter. Uh, let's say the inverter has a 98% efficiency, then goes through a motor, which has a 98% efficiency, then through a transmission, which has a 99.5% uh, efficiency. Again, in this case, it's just one gear, but you're going to have losses through that gear regardless. You have losses through everything. If you multiply all these together, you get 95% efficiency. These are not numbers from Mercedes. The only thing Mercedes was willing to tell me is that the inverter and the motor make up the majority of the losses. So I just made up these as an example of how you could get to 95%. But what this really illustrates is how close this is to the limit because you know think about how much does it take to improve this just a little bit uh, and is it worth that financially right like these are really good numbers and if it takes a lot of money to increase that 99.5 to 99.6 it's like was that worth doing so again we're getting towards the theoretical limit on efficiency when we're talking about powertrains uh, in the realm of 95%. Now, before we get into the juicy finale on theoretical limits, I think it's cool to look at existing technology in comparison to what Mercedes is seeking to achieve. So they set out to achieve 10 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. According to the EPA, the best efficiency we've ever seen in a production car sold in the United States is the Tesla Model 3 Standard Range Plus, which achieved about 15 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. So we still have a significant jump between that and this Mercedes, uh, or about 142 mile per gallon equivalent. Now, if you look at combustion engines without the assistance of a large battery pack, so I'm excluding plug-ins here and only looking at hybrids or other gasoline diesel powered vehicles uh, that have the ultimate fuel source uh, is you know either diesel or gasoline and it is powering a combustion engine. The best example sold in the United States with the highest combined rating is the Hyundai Ionic Hybrid which had a combined rating of 59 miles per gallon or about 35 kilowatt hours per hundred kilometers. So you can see how much of a gap there is this is actually drawn to scale uh, in kilowatt hours per kilometer. Uh, how much of a gap there is between combustion engines and electric cars? It is massive. Now, that is not to say that there are not bad electric cars out there. The Hummer EV is off the charts. It's up here. Uh, and that is because it has uh, an incredibly large energy consumption. It is more efficient than a Hyundai Ioniq, but it's massive. It's not aerodynamically uh, efficient, shall we say. And so because of that, its energy consumption is very high. So the Ioniq is really impressive for what it is. For a gasoline powered vehicle, it is extremely impressive. But overall, we're limited at an efficiency with these combustion engines of about 35%. And you might say, Jason, there are combustion engines out there with greater than 35% efficiency. Yeah, some of them have achieved 50%. But what manufacturers love to do is give you one number at one condition, at one RPM, one load, uh, that it can achieve that 50% and they ignore the rest. In the real world, combustion engines, especially the ones in cars we like to drive, they vary in RPM and they vary in load. And so yeah, you can have things like CVTs, you can have a, a series hybrid, you can do things like that to optimize that combustion engine, but ultimately there will be variance in the loading and because of that, there will be inefficiencies. So there is a cap, um, you know, somewhere around this 60 mile per gallon plus uh, where combustion engines just aren't going to go beyond that without the help of something like an electric powertrain. 
So was Mercedes able to achieve their goal of driving a thousand kilometers? Yes, they did it twice. So they did two drives in Europe both times. They were easily able to achieve, uh, you know, that 10 kilowatt hour per 100 kilometer. In fact, they beat it quite significantly. Uh, the first one being at 8.7 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers, easily hitting a thousand kilometers on their drive. And then the second one, 8.3 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers, uh, they hit 1200 kilometers on that drive. So I'll show the speeds and distances that they went on the screen. But ultimately, what's really interesting about this to me is that when we start to look at all of these factors, you know, we, we've maxed out our aerodynamics from both the frontal area of a practical vehicle and something that looks like a car and not a penguin. Uh, we've, you know, we've done really well with our tires. We've done extremely well with our powertrain. Perhaps we could pull out some weight, but again, understand that this is just 20% of overall energy. So even if we were to cut that weight in half, which would be extremely hard to do, well, then you're only saving 10% total energy. You know, so even if you go to 100% efficiency with your powertrain, right, it doesn't get you all that much. So if you start to look at these numbers here, it kind of tells you that a real world realistic efficiency cap, the theoretical limit that we're not going to go beyond is about eight kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers or the equivalent of uh, those of you in America of about 260 miles per gallon. And you can see, you know, compared to the technology we have today in production cars, we're at 142. So yes, we have room for improvement, um, but it's not going to go to some insane level. You know, there's that 15 versus this eight. Maybe we can get, you know, half of that. Uh, but, but that's really a stretch in order to get there. I mean, you can see some of the compromises that have to be made, um, but, but things can be done to get to a better point than where we are. And ultimately, there is a limit of where we can go. Thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below.